Welcome back to the first night of Omicron Delta Kappa's 2021 National Leadership Conference, Navigating 21st Century Leadership. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Clifford, immediate past chair of Omicron Delta Kappa Board of Trustees, who will formally introduce tonight's keynote speaker. As a reminder, um, following Dr. Tiefenthaler's remarks, I will moderate a fireside chat. So please feel free to include your questions for her during our conversation um, to make sure that you're included as well as part of our fireside chat. Dr. Clifford. Thanks very much, Alexis. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the staff of the National Headquarters, I want to express our sincere appreciation for the work of the numerous national volunteers who support the society, especially our faculty and staff colleagues who serve as circle assistants, circle coordinators, and faculty advisors. We know that the immediate past and current academic years have been exceptionally challenging with the pandemic's impact on how classes are taught and how our campuses operated. Thank you for helping continue to make Omicron Delta Kappa a priority for yourself, for your students, and for your institutions. Our society is indebted to you and for your devotion and support of ODK. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Dr. Jill Tiefenthaler since she was my colleague at Wake Forest University where she served as the university's provost and chief academic affairs officer. Not only do I consider her a colleague, but I also consider her a friend. Dr. Tiefenthaler, a 2010 initiate of the Wake Forest University Circle, earned her undergraduate degree in economics at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. She went on to earn her master's degree and PhD from Duke University. Her first faculty appointment was at Colgate University where she eventually became a professor of economics, department chair, associate dean, and a senior advisor to Colgate's president before arriving at Wake Forest. At Wake, she redesigned the admissions process to include an SAT optional policy, integrated the university's undergraduate and graduate business schools, established the Institute for Public Engagement and the Humanities Institute, and implemented Living Our Values, a plan to strengthen residential life and campus vibrancy. And it was through that initiative that I had the opportunity to get to know her better. After her tenure at Wake Forest, Dr. Tiefenthaler was named president at Colorado College in 2011. And during her nine years at the helm of Colorado College, she executed the most ambitious fundraising campaign in the college's history, developed a campus master plan and led the college's efforts to achieve carbon neutrality. She also drove significant increases in diversity among the faculty and student body and led the campus community in an external review of racism at the college. In 2020, Dr. Tiefenthaler was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the National Geogra Geographic Society. And in her present position, she oversees the development and implementation of that society's mission-driven work and programmatic agenda. She leads a global community of explorers, including scientists, innovators, educators, and storytellers in National Geographic's mission to protect, cherish, and celebrate the wonder of our planet. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Jill Tiefenthaler. Thank you so much, Matt. I love, I really appreciate that warm welcome and I'm so honored to be here tonight. Um, tonight, I join you all from National Geographic headquarters in Washington, DC, where as Matt indicated in my, my ninth month of my tenure as CEO. One of the most fulfilling parts of my job is meeting people around the world who bring our community to life. So many people told me stories about their connection to National Geographic and in particular, how they grew up with our magazine. This was the case for me. I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and without many opportunities to see the world, I explored through the pages of National Geographic magazine. 
I love hearing these stories. I believe our shared connections captured the magic of the National Geographic Society, a legacy of exploration and adventure driven by a mission to change the world for the better. And Nat Geo and ODK are two organizations that share a commitment to advancing meaningful change. In fact, we have a shared history that goes back more than 50 years. In 1963, a member of this leadership society took this photo, Eric, do we have the photo? Which made the cover of National Geographic magazine. His name was Barry Bishop, a Nat Geo explorer and photographer with a passion for science and mountaineering. He was part of a groundbreaking expedition to summit Mount Everest. At that time, only a handful of people had scaled the world's highest peak. Their goal was to be the first Americans to do it. Being an explorer often means forging into the unknown, taking risks and working in challenging environments. Everest is as harsh and hostile as it gets. Sub-zero temperatures, winds whipping at 70 miles an hour, limited oxygen, avalanches, the climb is grueling. It took the team two years of planning and lots of resource. 27 tons of equipment and food, more than 900 porters to help carry the equipment to the base of the mountain, and nearly seven, uh, nearly 40 Sherpas to support them as they scaled Everest. When Barry and one of his teammates finally reached the summit, Barry said they, quote, cried like babies with joy for having scaled the mightiest of mountains and with relief that the long torture of the climb had ended. Barry then planted the National Geographic flag next to the American flag. And he was later quoted as saying, I'd have crawled on my hands and knees to put the society's flag beside old glory. This is an iconic image in our archives and their audacious feat became known around the world. The expedition was even the subject of National Geographic's first ever television special. Are we getting the slides? Okay, great. So what does it take to stand on the top of the world? Grit, courage, perseverance, vision, goal setting, teamwork, adaptability, a spirit of exploration. These are all traits that will serve you well in navigating 21st century leadership. But how do we build and apply skills like these in our own careers? How do we climb to new heights as leaders? especially when we have our own obstacles to overcome. Increased demands, leaner teams, smaller budgets, a pandemic. Most of us know good leadership when we see it, but it comes in so many different shapes and sizes that it can sometimes seem intangible. I've seen all kinds of effective leaders, serious, funny, outgoing, reserved. Some naturally have the charisma to walk into a room and transform it. Others acquire the skills to engage teams on a quieter level, but achieve, achieve the same results. I know great leaders who are naturals and others who developed over time. And that's what I'm excited to share with you today. The key leadership lessons that I've learned during my personal journey and the leadership philosophy that I live by today. I didn't always see myself as a leader. I was a teacher, an economist, a scholar, my path to president of a top liberal arts college and CEO of a global nonprofit wasn't planned. But looking back, so many of my experiences and choices and some luck got me where I am today. I first learned courage and leadership on the farm in Iowa where I grew up. Fewer than half of the people in my community went to college and almost none went out of state. I was eager to try something new, so I talked my parents into letting me go all the way to Indiana <laughs> to a small women's college. It was one of the most transformative choices I made because it immersed me in the life of the mind. It was there that I was first introduced to economics and where I met my first great mentors. I went on to Duke to pursue my master's and doctorate in economics and learned pretty quickly that my path there was unusual as well. I was one of only two women in my class. There I met my husband who was also pursuing a PhD in econ and we went on the academic job market together and landed at Colgate as economics professors. 
It was during my time at Colgate that people started telling me that I could be a leader and I always laughed it off. I'd never read a leadership book or taken a leadership class. I'd never taken one of those personality tests or identified my leadership style. And I might add, I was actually quite proud of that. I love teaching economics and spent the next decade doing just that. Ultimately, I became the first woman tenured in my department. Along the way, my husband and I had two kids. We had this whole amazing world and life was bliss. And that's of course, when you get the call that changes your plans. The provost asked me to be chair. I was newly tenured. I'd never been an administrator before. I thought about saying no, but she had a wonderful gift for getting people to do things. And so marked the beginning of a new path. I served as chair for a few years, then went on to become associate dean of the faculty and a full-time administ administrator. Life was great. Can you guess what happened next? Things changed again. An opportunity emerged to become provost at Wake Forest. I was excited to explore another new path, but it was around this time that I asked myself, how does an effective leader become an, how does an accidental leader become an effective leader? I knew that I had to become more thoughtful and intentional about leadership. I wasn't exactly sure what great leadership was, but I knew it was more than being reactive and solving today's problem. So what do academics do when they decide to learn about something? Research. <laughs> I read a lot of books, talked to lots of leaders and got some very good advice. I started investing in and implementing some key leadership tools, which would culminate in becoming president of Colorado College. I didn't originally plan for any of these leadership roles. So how did it happen? By taking risks. When new opportunities emerge, I stepped, I stepped outside my comfort zone. To be a leader, you have to be willing to explore and pursue new paths, no matter how scary they may seem at the outset. And becoming president of Colorado College was a testament to that. I loved my job. I reached the summit of my own leadership journey and tended to stay in academia for the remainder of my career. But then after nine years, I got another unexpected call. This time it was from a headhunter. She was looking for a CEO for the National Geographic Society. My immediate thought was they're looking for a scientist. And yes, people do call economics the dismal science, but scientists at Net Geo are people who swim with the sharks and study active volcanoes. Plus I loved my life as an academic and my career in higher ed, which I'd spent 30 plus years building. But there was also this other thought that kept creeping in. It's National Geographic. I've got to explore this, right? Much to my excitement, I learned that the skills I learned throughout my time in academia, academia were valuable and transferable. And this role was so complex and interesting. Most of you are already familiar with the magazine, maybe the channel or the tile on Disney Plus. But did you know that the National Geographic Society is a nonprofit organization? We were founded 133 years ago and throughout our history, we awarded grants to explorers around the world, more than 14,000 to date. It's what inspired me to join the National Geographic family because the organization shares my values. They have a commitment to mission, transformative education, boldness, and a drive to advance real meaningful change. Today, our mission is to use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Our mission comes to life by investing in a global community of National Geographic explorers. They are in fact cutting edge scientists, educators, journalists, innovators, and photographers. Remarkable people like Barry Bishop, Jane Goodall, oceanographers Sylvia Earle and Bob Ballard, conservationist Do uh, Dominique Gonsalves and Enrique Sala, and many, many others. They're extraordinary individuals who take bold risks and dream big. In doing so, they make profound contributions drive impact, and enrich all our lives. It wouldn't be National Geographic without a video, so I'd like to play a short clip to give you a glimpse of our explorer's work. If I was an explorer. If I was an explorer. I would wake up. Put on my gear. Put on my hijab. Binoculars, a hat. I would take my tools to investigate. I'd put on my spacesuit. 
and then I'd shoot off into the stars. If I was an explorer, I'd climb into a rocket. I'd fly to the sun. I like to go to the places that most people usually don't go to. Explore my city. I'd tell stories to the world with my photos and videos of my experiences, my discoveries. I'd go to the depths of space, the bottom of an ocean. If I was an explorer, I wouldn't care about getting dirty. I would discover and analyze different things that have never been seen before. I'll discover new species. I would take my findings back to the lab to build things, create new things. I'd find a cure for cancer. I'd recycle our trash to build buildings. I'd make the world a better place. Maybe an explorer is all about understanding this world better. To show the world a different way of seeing. To venture into uncharted territory. My name is Arthur Huang. My name is Hannah Reyes Morales. My name is Dominique Demille Correa Gonçalves. And this, this is what right. an explorer looks like. I never thought I'd leave higher education and engage with more fascinating people. But as you can see, our explorers differentiate the society from any other organization. We currently support about 6,000 explorers around the globe. The society has a staff of about, of about 400. Most are headquartered here in DC, but we also have five offices around the globe. We have the wise council and leadership of board members who are titans of industry, science, and philanthropy. We're also fortunate to have a partnership with the Walt Disney Company, one of the most recognized and beloved brands in the world. As I lead this amazing organization, I lean on the lessons I've learned from the positions I've had throughout my career, as well as the advice of the people I've worked with along the way. From all those people, I've developed my leadership philosophy. For me, a leader's job comes down to four components. I learned the first three many years ago at a lunch with a board member. He was a venture capitalist and we were discussing leadership. When I asked him about what great leaders do, he answered without thinking. First, set the overall vision and strategy of the organization. Next, communicate the vision to your stakeholders. You have to secure the resources to implement the vision. I asked, is that it? He said the CEO should delegate all the other tasks to the team. I thought about that advice so often over the years. It's this framework that I've adopted, but along the way, I've added a fourth component, hire and develop the right people, the very best talent to realize the vision. Of course, we all, including, including great leaders, do much more than these four things, but they're critical to success. Whether you're leading a small team or the entire organization, the leader's job is to understand the institutional vision and strategy and link it to your department's goals and objectives, communicate the vision and strategy to your team and explain the link between the goals and objectives and the vision, find the resources to implement the strategy. Can you make the case for additional resources or redeploy by stopping some uh, programs or practices? And then make sure you have the right people to get it done. In this economic climate, new positions might not be a realistic. Can you move people around, help staff develop new skills and work cross-functionally? If there's a great vision and leaders are in place to implement these steps, the organization will move forward in a concerted effort. So the job of a leader is clear and simple, right? We know it's much more complicated to put it into practice. So I wanna spend some time talking about how to do it. While the job of a leader is essentially the same regardless of the organization or role, context matters. Different leaders have different styles and different philosophies. I found in both higher education and the nonprofit world, the servant leadership model is the most effective for me. Robert Greenleaf, author of The Servant is Leader, wrote that a great leader has experience as a servant to others. The fact, this fact is central to his or her greatness. 
True leadership emerges from those whose primary motivation is a deep desire to help others. Greenleaf first coined the term servant leader in a 1970 essay after reading Herman Hesse's Journey to the East. One of the main characters in Hesse's novel is a servant named Leo, whose motivating spirit inspires a band of men on a mythical journey. Leo does their menial chores, but also sustains them on their difficult trek. When Leo disappears, the group falls apart. Only many years later, does one member of the party encounter Leo again, and he discovers that Leo was not a servant, but actually the head of the order, its guiding spirit, and a great and noble leader. As the story of Leo shows, the best leadership is not about being above others or being in charge or sitting in a corner office giving commands, or even being the boss. It's about being part of something and using that platform as one of the group to inspire others. So being a servant leader is first about being part of the community. As Greenleaf writes, it begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve and to serve first. This step has been key throughout my career as chair, dean, provost, president, CEO. I knew from my time as a faculty member that you can't lead academics with top-down leadership. When I first took the job as provost at Wake, my dad, who's still a farmer in Iowa, called me and asked, so what does it feel like to be the boss? I told him, dad, I am the boss of no one. The only way that I get anyone to do anything is persuasion. I shared with him a joke that I'd heard from a fellow provost. Do you know what a provost and a cemetery caretaker have in common? Lots of people under you, but nobody listens. <laughs> My ability to lead in academia and at National Geographic depends on being part of the community, understanding what we do and finding ways to help explorers and staff do their jobs even better. I often see my job as CEO as the cheerleader on the bottom of the pyramid, the one that holds everyone up not the one who raises her arms at the top. The stronger I am, the higher we all climb. How do you live or implement servant leadership? Let's go back to the leader's job and see how servant leadership informs the four things that leaders do. And let's start with setting the vision or strategy. How do you move an institution or company forward in pursuit of its mission? How do you decide on the right strategy? When I started my presidency at Colorado College, I undertook a year of listening. I wanted to understand the strengths and opportunities of the college, but also learn about the community's aspirations and ideas. Now, why is listening a leadership opportunity? Because it helps you understand the depth, breadth, and complexity of the organization, as well as the people who bring it to life. What you learn from your team, students, and constituents was invaluable to informing the strategy. The process was so successful at Colorado College that I applied it again when I began my role at National Geographic last August. I embarked on a three month listening tour with members of our community, connecting with more than 400 people around the world. I learned about our strengths, our brand, mission, power to convene, partnership with Disney. I learned we could better leverage opportunities by developing a unified strategy, realizing the potential of fundraising, doubling down on our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, to name a few. I also learned about the challenges that stood in our way, like a lack of focus and too many silos. Hundreds of people also shared their aspirations for the society. I resoundingly heard about the critical role our explorers play to realize our mission. Ultimately, the listening tour and the document I wrote to summarize what I heard crystallized our vision. And this collective feedback created the foundation for the society's strategic plan. Our strategic planning process is currently underway. To date, our collaborative process has engaged 250 people, staff, leadership, trustees, and partners in over 150 meetings. And remember that all of this took place in a completely virtual environment. To invite conversation, generate creative thinking, and ensure inclusivity throughout the process, the team asked staff to add their suggestions using virtual sticky notes. And altogether, they've counted more than 6,000 stickies. We now have a draft strategic plan and we're on our way to finalize it in the next few months. 
The process is key. It's slow and time intensive, but we ended up with a strategy that we will all own and are part of. Next, let's dive deeper into communication. It's so essential, but it doesn't start with e sending email or giving a report at a meeting. It starts with listening and observing. It sounds so simple, but it isn't because listening is the most under leveraged and hardest part of communicating. How can you make sure that you're hearing what needs to be heard? First, don't isolate yourself or surround yourself with yes people. We know how it happens. Leadership's hard and the only way not to get criticized is to not do anything. Criticism's hard to take, especially in this technological age when so much of it's public. Some leaders respond by clothing, closing themselves off in the corner office or surrounding themselves with people who praise them and don't tell them bad news. Don't do it. Walk the halls, reward those who tell you what might be hard to hear and make yourself available. I've learned so many important things by being available and listening. And that's another important aspect of listening so you can serve successfully. You have to be present. This is incredibly difficult in our 21st century world because there's so much competition for what you're doing right now. The constant and immediate string of emails and text messages creates a sense of urgency in leaders, a need to always be plugged in, and a notion that just because we can respond quickly, we must respond quickly. We think the best leaders are those who are always busy and can multitask, looking at their phone in meeting or, or even right in the middle of a conversation. But is that really true? How can you listen, learn, and support if you aren't present? We live in a world where everyone's plugged in, but not really tuned in. This has gotten worse during the pandemic when multitasking has become our default by the sheer nature of working remotely. But as I'm sure many here know, studies show that multitasking actually makes us less efficient and more prone to error. One of my most steadfast rules is that when I'm with someone, I'm present. I don't read emails or texts in meetings. I focus on the people who I'm with when I'm with them. People won't bring you their problems or their ideas if you seem too busy or don't seem to care. Put down the phone and be present. People also won't bring you their problems if they think that asking for help is a sign of weakness or failure. You can make it clear that this isn't the case by asking for help yourself. Servant leaders listen and create a culture where colleagues bring them their problems because they have confidence that the leader will help them and believe that they care. And just as upward communication is essential to servant leadership, don't forget about the importance of communicating back. Successful leaders develop a strong plan and embody that plan every day. Their communications clarify the organization's narrative, where it is and where they're going in kind of a drip, drip, drip manner, as opposed to a deluge that reminds the community of strategic direction, priorities and goals. This is focus daily work. And while messaging your plans is key, don't forget to also give the gift of acknowledgement, which can't be underestimated. Give praise when it's deserved, give credit where it's due. I've always set time aside each week to write cards to staff, students, donors, and others in the community to acknowledge their achievements and recognize those who've gone above and beyond. These small gestures have an incredible impact. As I said at the beginning, great leaders surround themselves with talented people, listen to them, support them, give them latitude to act by delegating and empowering liberally and acknowledge their contributions. Securing the resources is also crucial to implementing this strategy. Are there sufficient resources to get the job done and are the right priorities in place? If not, can you justify additional resources? Can you replace some activities with more strategic investments? While this is sometimes money, and you may have to fundraise or advocate with your boss or board to get what you need for success, it also includes technology, communication support, and of course, the most important resource, your people. Which brings me to the next point, recruiting the right people. There is no doubt that hiring excellent people for the right jobs is key. However, putting together a team is not the same thing as just hiring a group of individuals. What I learned as a teacher is true for any team. 
everyone's experience in a classroom is improved when the students come from different backgrounds, bring different experiences, and have different talents and interests. It results in a much more interesting discussion and a more productive one. The same is true for a management team. You need diversity in many respects, gender, race, cultural background, age, styles, expertise. Diversity is key to working with your customers and constituents. Diversity is key to the best solutions. Diversity is key to attracting top talent. Diversity is key to excellence. But you will only sustain that diversity and retain your people if you're also an inclusive and equitable workplace. This is a key point of my work at National Geographic. We can only achieve excellence when our community is diverse and all members feel they belong and can bring their whole selves to work. Hiring great people is step one, then giving attention to developing your people is equally important. I agree, I strongly agree with Greenleaf that the best leaders, those who truly transform their organizations and communities succeed because they make the people around them better. They're committed to the growth of people. No matter how hard you work or how brilliant or clever you are, your impact acting solo will be minimal. You can't do it all, you can't know it all, and you will immobilize those who work with you if you try. However, if you surround yourself with talented people, support them and mentor them, and give them latitude to act by delegating you will make a difference. As the great Maya Angelou once observed, a leader sees greatness in other people. You can't be much of a leader if all you see is yourself. And oh yes, there are challenges. One of the most difficult parts of being a leader is getting people on board for change, doing things differently. While the world, while the world is moving faster than ever, Many people are highly resist change resistant. In fact, sometimes I think that because people see things moving so quickly in the world today, they're even more reluctant to accept change in their day-to-day -day work and lives. Therefore, change management is critical to successful leadership. The key to change uh, management is communication. Not just communicating when changes are fully baked, but sharing bits along the way engaging everyone in decisions that lead to significant change and pacing change. I often feel like my goal is to take us right to the edge of the cliff without pushing us over. I wanna give you a few additional challenges around servant leadership. First, don't mistake being a servant leader for being a pushover. Leaders must be courageous. You often have to make many decisions and some will be hard and unpopular. As Colin Powell says in his book, My American Journey, being responsible sometimes means pissing people off. You should also give people respect and empathize with them, but don't shy away from doing the best for your organization or community. Keeping in mind your responsibility as steward of your institution will guide you when you have to make tough decisions. Strive for respect and doing the right thing, not for love or popularity. Lastly, I hope that you realize that leadership, even servant leadership, can be lonely. I started by telling you how important it is to be part of the community and that I be, believe the best leaders see themselves as part of rather than above. The best leaders, servant leaders, create an informal, open, collaborative culture, but it's often still lonely when you assume the chair at the head of the table. So take care of yourself and build the outside relationships that you'll need to recharge your engines. One of the hardest parts of being a leader is the constant, constant tension between the requirements of the organization, engagement in your professional communities, and taking care of yourself. While the organization deserves and demands much of your attention, you also need to take care of your own professional development, which is important to the institution, and do what you need to for yourself. A few tips for your, own for your own professional development. First, watch other leaders, especially those you admire. Every leader I've worked with has taught me something. And the most authentic lessons came from figuring out each, what each person did best and observing her or his approach over time. Second, let people mentor you. I hope that you all have had great mentors 
mentors in your lives. We all need good mentoring. That means listening, respecting experience as wisdom, and investing time in relationships. Third, get a coach. Every professional person should have one, and ideally someone who doesn't work at the institution, an objective sounding board, and an honest critic or cheerleader. Fourth, invest in yourself, in learning about yourself. Leaders are busy, but don't forget to take time for reflection. Invest in learning about leadership, like you're doing today, and learning about yourself. I really didn't do this much until later in my career in higher ed. In fact, I just never thought it would be useful. I'd become an accidental leader and it was working pretty well. I kept getting promoted. People told me I was doing a great job. Why mess it up? How wrong I was. In the past decade, I've invested in more of this type of training and it has been incredibly valuable to me as a leader and as a person. One of the most valuable things that I continually engage in is diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Given the importance of DEI to excellence and the very much needed pace of change, we need to be current. I've been through many of these uh, throughout my career because I do them with my staff to set the right example, and I learn something every single time. And of course, you need to take care of yourself. As a leader, your job could take 24-7 if you let it. Just as you need to be present at work, you need to be present with your loved ones and you need to take care of your health. Sleep, exercise, and take vacations. Make time for the things you love to do. I stress this with those who work with me as it's good for the organization. People, who, people do better work and are much more fun to work with when they practice good self-care. All of these lessons have been put to the test during the pandemic. It's been such a challenging time, not only to lead an organization, but to begin leading one. I've only met about four people at National Geographic in person. Here's an image of staff during one of my many, many, many Zoom meetings. People have asked me what I learned during the pandemic, and more than anything, the pandemic has reinforced my belief in the servant leadership model. It's even more important to listen, to communicate, to collaborate. We're separated from the people we work with, so it's imperative to reach out to everyone to stay connected. I made it a point during the pandemic to hold biweekly all hands meetings and send weekly notes to staff. People also need compassion and empathy more than ever. It's essential to support me, people, not only because it's the right thing to do, because it'll build loyalty and productivity. I worked with my leadership team to support staff and create as much space and grace as we could. As we could. For example, we created meeting three times each day, added extra days off, and encouraged people to take vacation. We created flexibility for staff and fa families, particularly those with kids. Also, start from a place of trust. One of the great things I think we've learned in the pandemic is something I always expected. You don't need to stand over people to get things done. It's so important to treat people like adults, bring the right assumption and give people the benefit of the doubt. This reinforces the notion that top-down leadership doesn't work as people are more productive when they're inspired. And the data actually shows us that during the pandemic, people are more productive and working longer hours. On the negative side, I think we've also learned that it's so hard to be present and we need collaboration to be creative. We've suffered in these two areas over this difficult year. At National Geographic, I'm grateful to stand on the shoulders of trailblazing leaders in both in the field and in the office. After his triumph on Everest, Barry Bishop would go on to work at the Society for 31 years, becoming the chairman of our Committee for Research and Exploration, overseeing the awarding of two to 300 grants annually. When looking back on his life, Barry spoke of wanderlust, saying, I guess a bug hit me at an early age. I was really intrigued, always wanted to see what lies over the next ridge. His philosophy was steeped in curiosity and adventure. And adventure. No matter what path you choose, embrace the spirit of exploration. Be fearless, continue to look over the next ridge to see what's possible. When you step outside your comfort zone and are open to learning, new opportunities emerge. I wanna leave you with one more quote 
from another National Geographic le legend, the great oceanographer, Sylvia Earle, who said, hold up a mirror and ask yourself what you're capable of doing and what you really care about. Then take the initiative. Don't wait for someone else to ask you to act. You have initiative, it's why you're here. So continue investing in your leadership, know yourself and lead from who you are. Lead from a philosophical frame and embody that philosophy. It's powerful. Make sure to regularly reflect on progress and setbacks as a way to develop yourself. With these tools, you can climb any mountain to success. Thank you. And now I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. Um, and we have actually received some questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and look forward to hearing um, your responses. Um, and I wanna start actually with something you just finished talking about, and that's this idea of exploration and looking around the next ridge. Um, but one of the aspects of exploration, it also comes with risk, including risk of failure, things not turning out as expected. Um, can you share your thoughts about the role of failure in exploration as well as leadership? Yeah, I think we sometimes focus too much on either success or failure when life is really about a whole lot in the middle. Um, I, I was talking to my team recently, and I sort of believe in this pilot and pivot kind of um, way of looking at the world instead of sort of, you know, success or failure. And that's try something, see what works. Um, double down on what works and change what doesn't, you know, and try to fail fast, right? Figure that out as quickly as possible so that you're uh, not wasting time or, or won't give up um, things that aren't working. Um, and the other part I always want to think about is own, own mistakes and failure and don't be defensive. Uh, you take a lot of the air out of any critics when you can do that and you can help more, move your organization forward more quickly. You also spoke about the leadership roles that you've had. And as a woman leader, you've been a first and a trailblazer many times throughout your career. You mentioned uh, being one of the few men, excuse me, being one of the few women in your graduate program, the first woman tenured in your department, and the first woman CEO at National Geographic. You also spoke about the importance of having the right people on your team. How do you ensure that women and others who are underrepresented in leadership roles are supported and elevated? Yeah, so it's, as I mentioned in my talk, it's so critical that um, we continue to have a more diverse leadership teams and workforce. We know that's not true across the country right now, and it really truly is about excellence. Um, so I try to do that in lots of ways. I think one of the things I'm most proud about over my career is all the folks I've mentored in my career. There are lots of uh, women who are now professors at um, colleges and universities around the country or deans or presidents at colleges who I've had the pleasure of working with and mentoring um, throughout the, my career. So that, that commitment um, to paying it forward so those that you work with get those opportunities. And then on my own team, I think one way we have to do is we have to slow down and take the time to build pools and not just do things the way we've always done to change the nature of leadership and what leadership looks like in this country, um, we need to be more intentional and do things uh, differently. You spoke about mentors um, in, in your remarks as well. And if you don't mind sharing, how do you have advice on how to either identify mentors or help select them? Or what does that look like? I feel like so many times we struggle in either identifying those individuals or quite frankly, just either asking or approaching them um, about their, their possible influence in our personal and professional careers? Yeah, you know, I think it's important to find people, you know, I, I often tell people, mentors don't always have to look exactly like you. I think sometimes they're, but they're, they're, you find some shared affinity with people, right? That there's a connection. Um, and part of that means networking and finding people that, that you feel that way about and they feel that way about you. And then having those conversations, you know, um, asking for that help. The one number one thing, though, I think that's really important to getting having great mentors is actually 
wanting to be really mentored and actually putting in the work. Um, over the years, the mentors that I've continued to connect with are people who, you know, didn't just ask you and then, you know, um, just want you to hear how great they are or only use you in, you know, certain kinds of opportunities, but really did want to take the time to build the relationship, wanted, um, you know, critical feedback and advice, as well as just support when it was, you know, when it's needed. And we're willing to listen, right, and really um, put in the time. And just like it's a huge commitment for the mentor, um, to be meant to get a, a lot out of it, you have to put a huge commitment in to be mentored and, you know, invest in those relationships. So we are starting to get some questions in the chat. Um, Gabriella would like to know, how did you find the opportunity for your position at National Geographic? Literally, I was so not looking. I, you know, I was um, enjoying a very, very busy job at Colorado College, and I literally got a call from a headhunter who said I'd been nominated for the job by a few people and um, was almost too busy to try to take the time to even have conversations about it. Um, but um, I'm glad I did, and then they had, you know, I didn't, over several months, I had some interviews and discussions, and a lot of referencing was done and um, I was offered the position. And as I said, I never thought I would leave, leave higher ed and I loved higher ed, but um, couldn't say no to National Geographic. Dara wants to know what is the biggest difference for you between being a leader at National Geographic and being a leader in academia? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of similarities. I was surprised by that. A lot of the business model, fundraising, managing an endowment, those kind of things. Um, also, you know, we've got this community of explorers, um, which is kind of like working with faculty who, you know, are doing their own work and, you know, creating things and publishing, et cetera. Um, but I'd say the biggest, the biggest difference is probably the nimbleness. You know, um, I love higher ed, but, you know, it's not known for a nimble. Part of that is so many constituents, right? Students, faculty, staff, um, community, local communities, et cetera. And I love the fact at National Geographic how quickly we're able to pivot and move and try new things. Um, even during the pandemic, I've been so excited to see the, the, um, the opportunities we have to forge a new strategy and move forward and do some, do some different things. Cheryl just wrote, I just started a new job as a new supervisor over a very lively group. <laughs> and she's a little bit more on the quiet side. And this is her first job as a supervisor over such a large group. Mm. Any thoughts or advice on how to get um, respect and connections with employees? Yeah, it's a, you know, starting those first supervisor jobs are, it's always, that's, it, you know, it's hard. And during the pandemic, I don't know if Cheryl's working um, remotely or in person, it can be even a bigger challenge to try to do that over Zoom. Um, but, you know, I'd go back to some of the things I told, I said earlier, I'd, I'd start by listening to the team. You know, if you're new to the, uh, new to the team, asking for their advice, you know, learn as much as you can from them. Um, and then, um, you know, where it makes sense, you know, it, reflect those ideas and input that you've given. I think more than anything, um, you know, you, we, we can learn so much from listening to the people that we work with. And sometimes I think we have this crazy idea that um, excellent leaders and, and respect comes from being everything, having to come from you and being original and top down, when actually people will support, will support your work and your leadership and get behind what you want to do when they're engaged um, in that process. So I, I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't fall into this sort of um, notion of what we think sometimes about leadership. Um, and, you know, embrace that, you know, my advice would be to try the servant leadership model and uh, see, see how it works with the team. As we know, there's so much more connection in a lot of ways, in addition to um, less personal connection, there's so much as it relates to social media. And as we've commented um, individually uh, earlier, the Zoom world. Mm -hmm. um, do you have recommendations for someone who's trying to improve either social skills or communication skills um, to continue to move forward in their leadership journey? Yeah, you know, I, I'd say one thing, um, you know, 
working on Zoom is even though we're doing it now um, and we're all having to figure out how to lead and participate and grow during this time, it's probably going to be a part of our lives um, going forward, even post pandemic. Um, and some people are really great on Zoom and some are not. Um, and so one of the things I would just go back to that point that I made earlier about being present through this time. And, um, you know, I can tell when people are, are, they think they're looking at the screen and I can tell when they're, when they're not listening, when they're reading something else or they're looking at the website or trying to multitask. So I'd say, try to be present um, and try to be, you know, find ways to bring that energy through um, in this time. Um, I think that's another really important thing. You know, I think the skill of active listening um, is a really great, great one always, but certainly um, in this framework where, you know, you can be that person who can um, affirm what you heard before you always move forward. Um, you know, one of the hardest parts I think is communicating this time is humor, right? It's really difficult and, um, you know, figuring out how to not step on people and make room for other people is really difficult. I don't know how many times we've all been in Zooms, not only when we, you know, we're on mute, but more importantly, when we, no one's talking and then five people talk at the same time. Um, but I do think, um, you know, figuring out, can, you know, we're going to continue to refine um, some of these, these virtual skills. Um, but a lot of the same lessons apply as in person. Jess has asked, during each phase of your career, how did you know you were in the right place doing what you were meant to do? You know, I don't know. I, you know, I really truly in that first phase, I thought that would be my life's work to be a faculty member. That's what I, I wanted to be a teacher and a scholar. And I love the classroom and I love economics and learning. And I, I really thought that's where I always wanted to be. Um, and through each next step, I, you know, I think it's part of this, you know, I don't want to be too much of a broken record, but I do think it's part of this being present, right? I think sometimes we spend so much time thinking about where we want to be next that we can't actually enjoy and, um, and, and succeed at what we're doing right now. And I, I really do believe that if we can, we can seize the moment, seize the current opportunity, more of those opportunities will, will pop up in the future. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had a few moments, um, you know, when I first became an administrator, when I really hated it, I'd given up my faculty career. I, you know, I was like, what did I do? Um, and then after several months, you know, I started to see all this opportunity um, and I started to really love it. So the only other thing I would just say is that every moment in these jobs is not magical. In fact, every even though I think I won the job lottery and I love my position today, there are lots of days I do things I don't want to do. You know, lots of meetings that are difficult, lots of hard conversations. And I think that's one important thing in that, you know, you want the job to be more of the good um, things that you love than, than those you don't. But it's still work, right? And every job you do is going to, you're going to have to do some things that are hard and difficult and not your favorite things to do. So Tim has asked, mm -hmm. NetGeo is about exploring, studying, and learning. It's about wanting to know more. How can ODK leaders contribute to that mentality? That's uh, it. You know, I think that's a great question. I think we can all do that every day in our work and bring that to our organization. You know, one of the things I think when I came to National Geographic, we had this amazing, adventurous, cool mission, right? We couldn't think of anything more risky and, and exciting, but not all of our practices here at the organization actually reflect that. In fact, sometimes it felt because of the old brand and the old history, sometimes it felt it feels kind of small C conservative. So part of our, one of our goals in our strategic plan is to um, have a more innovative workplace and to embrace the riskiness and the adventure and the innovation and creativity that we see in our mission in our day-to-day -day work. And I think all organizations can do that. Um, and you know, it's and I think we'll benefit it from it, especially in the time we're in. I often talk to staff about the COVID accelerator, right? Everything is now happening faster than it used to in a weird way when we're all sitting at home on Zoom. But changes that were coming have been 
have now been completed through through the pandemic. And I think we all just have to become more open to change, more willing to try things um, and more innovative and, and creative. So I would just say every organization can embrace that spirit of exploration. And related to that, Megan asks, what if anything has been easier in regards to leading in a virtual setting compared to in-person? One huge thing that has been, I was just thinking about this earlier today, um, as much as I miss the excitement of travel and seeing people in events, um, in my life as college president, I traveled you know, at least every other week and I had an event probably four or five nights a week. Um, and I've now gone a year with om almost no travel and almost no events. Tonight's one of my few nighttime events here in, in, in DC, it's nighttime. But, um, and that's been kind of nice as a break, but I'm really ready to get back to it right now. <laughs> so we also got a question mm -hmm. of, how would a scientist get involved in NetGeo's programming or work? That's a great question. We have um, lots of ways for that to happen, but the biggest is we have a, a, um, grants and ex, uh, for explorers um, to become part of our community. So um, right now we're on a little bit of a pause because of the pandemic and people not being able to get into the field. Um, but probably later this fall, we'll be opening up our Explorer grant program again. And we start with um, early career but we also have a program for young explorers. And then um, once people are into our organization and are part of our network, they can move up through it. But our, but our um, entry level grants are open to the public, to anyone who wants to apply based on their, you know, having the right credentials as a scientist, et cetera. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about this a little bit, but I, I would appreciate uh, if you could just go in a little bit more. Um, you, you included in your remarks about the new strategic plan for National Geographic, and you also talked about in, uh, embracing risk um, in the workplace, um, as well as obviously the impact of the pandemic. Uh, what do you believe are some changes from the last nine months that will continue to shape the work of National Geographic? Um, uh, you know, that's a great question. You know, one of the big things I think we're thinking of, but I think every business in the country is, is um, there's no way we're going back to the old model of work. You know, the, the FaceTime in the office, nine to five, five days a week. Um, we've seen, as I mentioned in my remarks, that people are really productive with a lot more flexibility um, and that there is great time for people to put their heads down and have undistracted time at home to get work done. Um, but we've also seen, uh, certainly at National Geographic with our staff surveys, is that we, it can't be full-time remote, right? Because people miss the collaboration. We don't have those accidental uh, conversations. We, you know, it's hard to ideate on Zoom. Um, it's hard to build new relationships or to onboard new people. It's been really difficult in the pandemic. So I think we, one of the things that will certainly happen here is we'll have some hybrid model of work um, that we're still working on. How can we give people that flexibility? and that time to balance work and life in a way that we know is, is better for people, um, but also make sure we have time to be together to build community and to, to collaborate. So that's one change I see coming for sure. Um, the other thing I think will really reassess travel. You know, we've, the pandemic is I think reinforced the, the problem we have with nature, um, us not taking care of nature and, and encroaching on nature and um, the carb climate change and our carbon footprint. And I think we've learned there are ways we, we can, you know, walk lighter on our planet through reducing travel with video, with reducing commuting, with virtual, um, some virtual, um, et cetera. Um, and the other thing um, I, I think that will probably go forward um, well, let me stop there. I think those are two of the big things. Yep. Okay. Uh, Kaylee would like to know what suggestions do you have for welcoming such large changes within a career path when opportunities uh, present themselves that are different from your what you might have thought was your initial path? Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's one of the the lessons that when I look back on my own career that I feel was is most important has been the the combination of diving in and doing what I'm doing now to the best of my ability, 
but being willing to take risks when they come up at the same time. So not being stuck in that. Um, and, you know, I think you have to always assess those risks and not necessarily jump at everything. And I, I certainly turned down many things throughout my career. Every, every change I made was not the only one presented. So I think looking at those risks, but, but being willing to try new things, even sometimes when you feel like you're pretty darn content and happy. Tori um, has mentioned, thank you so much uh, that this conversation has been helpful and informative and is already reaching out to know how to get involved in the NetGeo organization through internships, future yep. job opportunities, shadowing, um, not as a scientist, but potentially as an employee. Right. So we do have an internship program and it's, I believe it's, I'm not sure if it's still open, but we are, we'll be virtual this summer. Um, but for those of you still in college, we'll be continuing that next summer as well, and that'll be in person. And we're also actually also working on some uh, new ideas for expanding the field in, um, in our fields by creating some new opportunities for shadowing, et cetera. Um, but you can also you know, check out the Nat Geo website, whether it's Explorer or staff, where we talk, we'll We've been a little bit in a hiring freeze during the pandemic, but that's now changing as we're getting back into the field and opening up new positions. So there are always opportunities that are all on our website. And since we are almost right at that eight o'clock mark, if there is one last question, if I can ask. Sure. Uh, personally and or professionally, what is one thing or place you are looking forward to exploring next? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I've always um, wanted to go to Antarctica and I think I might get that opportunity in this new job. <laughs> I would say that that is, this is probably one of the few jobs that would give you that opportunity. Um, I also might know a person or two that would love to help you with that <laughs> trip. I'm just gonna throw that out there. That's right. <laughs> There's well, so many, so many great places to go. We have explorers in the field all over the world. It's super exciting to think about not only the places they are, but uh, seeing their impact. And again, thank you so much, not only for your time, but for the inspirational conversation and um, also in entertaining and answering the questions that have come through from our members. Um, I know, and again, on behalf of the myself, the committee, and the attendees, thank you so much. Um, I also want to express, again, ODK's gratitude for Student Playbook's support of the conference and tonight's opening keynote presentation. Uh, please be sure to update uh, your event Moby profile if you have not done so yet to our attendees. Um, it's so great to be able to see each other um, through either the chat function or through these different Zoom conversations and start engaging with each other. As a reminder, um, we will be opening up the meet and greet for our lifetime members very, very soon. So please join Johan and Ben um, and an opportunity to get to know each other. Check out those challenges. Um, there were plenty of opportunities tonight to engage um, and rack up those points. And again, somebody's got to give Jess a run for her money. Uh, the conference will resume tomorrow at noon Eastern with the daily welcome and remarks from Sally Albright, chair of Omicron Delta Kappa's board of trustees. And the concurrent sessions will take place throughout the afternoon with our next keynote presentation featuring Dr. Rick Bright at 5 p.m. Again, thank you for joining us as we are navigating 21st century leadership and we look forward to your participation also this evening as well as throughout the next couple of days. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.